Okay, so this is the third lecture, so summary of lecture two in five minutes. So what uh, we did last time was after explaining molecular dynamic simulations and their use in the first lecture, I told you about you know how hard it was to avoid crystallization, how hard it was to summarize the systems to do proper equilibrium simulations of glass forming liquids. Then we succeeded, so we computed the entropy, we did the standard dynamic integrations. I mentioned this mixing entropy mystery that I didn't really solve at the end of the day because nobody asked the question at the end. Uh, I moved to the potential energy landscape descriptions and how we partition configuration. We make partition configuration space to subtract from the total entropy some vibrational component from diagonalizing the Hessian in energy minima. And then we moved to Monte Carlo simulations to get faster than the physics uh, in a stochastic way. So we introduced detailed balance. I told you something about how the dynamics could be or could not be uh, f uh, resembling the, uh, the physics. And then I finish with this uh, ideas of uh, improving the efficiency of Monte Carlo simulations. So I told you about this cluster move, this event chain algorithm that Kraut is trying to develop in Paris for which we don't have very good uh, measurements of how fast they go. And Francesco and Patrick told me that they have worked on it a few years back and they say it, it's not really useful for dent glasses, they say, but no, nothing has been published. So one day someone should just uh, sit, do it, and measure and say what it does because it's, you know, shrouded with mystery. Then I introduce this uh, uh, a cluster move is just two particles, this swap move, and I say it works wonderfully and it, it seems like a miracle that was not necessarily uh, neither uh, expected nor uh, well understood uh, at the moment. So it's, it's very efficient. So with this thing, it means that we can access configurations that I claim are uh, equivalent to experimental uh, systems and even uh, we can access temperatures that look uh, lower than the experimental glass transition preparing systems that are extremely uh, stable, okay? So that's where we finished uh, last time and I have to restart. So regarding things we don't know and algorithms that are uh, uh, always discussed in the physics of uh, supercooled liquids. So one algorithm for which you know, we don't really know what's happening. It's called parallel tempering. I will discuss in a little more detail how it works later. It's essentially doing parallel cal uh, calculations on many copies of the system at different temperatures and exchanging these copies between uh, themselves in order to speed up the thermalization. It's been super heavily used in the, s in the field of uh, spin glasses, with so spin system with quench disorder. And it seems there that without these parallel tempering techniques, they wouldn't have been able to do much regarding, you know, description of the spin glasses at low temperatures. For bulk supercooled liquid, there are a few attempts. So people claim that it speeds up the dynamics. Some people say it, do it doesn't. We have used it. Some people have not used it. Nobody really knows. So is it good for glasses? I mean, for bulk supercooled liquid without quench disorder. Is it really good? Nobody knows really, and nobody has measured quantitatively uh, that thing. So I think, again, as for the event change, it would be nice if someone you know, could sit, compare, measure, and decide what parallel tempering does. My bet is that it's super bad. OK, but it's a bet I may lose. Uh, I'd like to know the answer to that question. So again, it's super bad for bulk supercooled liquids. I will use it later to compute the point to set correlation lengths. So it may be very good for different applications. Because that's what I think. <laughs> uh, it would require a larger, you know, I, would, I could explain to you at lunch if you want, but the, okay. I think absence of quench disorder is really crucial here. Okay, and quench disorder is going to come back with the point to set because you have these amorphous boundaries. Quench disorder is also useful, uh, is also imposed when you do this random pinning that we have done a lot over the recent years. And there, parallel tempering is very efficient, I think, at summarizing. But bulk supercooled liquids are different beasts. That's my view. Nobody did it, so I may be wrong, and I'd be happy to be proven wrong at the end. Uh, there is another Monte Carlo method that's been used in the context of ordinary first order, second order phase transition, is due to Wang and Landau. And I read about it in American Journal of Physics. And the paper is super easy to read. 
so it's uh, from 10, 15 years ago. And this idea is again sampling using statistical mechanics to sample again configuration space in a very efficient way. And what's cool, it seems, with the Wang Landau algorithm, in instead of probing the Boltzmann distribution, as you would do for an ordinary Monte Carlo uh, simulation that we discussed uh, last, uh, last lecture, they don't sample this guy, they already sample directly the density of state, and they do it in a very clever way, and so they do it with you know, flat histograms, relating things that we do that typically in Monte Carlo simulations. I don't want to explain. But the cool thing, it seems, with this, is that you don't impose a temperature at all. You really work at the level of the density of states. So we know that for supercooled liquid, what's problematic is accessing low temperatures. So maybe accessing low energies is as hard as you know, accessing low uh, temperatures in ordinary Monte Carlo. But there is just one paper by the De Pablo group in Chicago who's tried to do Wang Landau for supercooled liquids. It's not clear what it does because, you know, we have nothing to, be to compare the results to you know, something that looks like equilibrium. From the paper, it's not clear that it does a lot, but it's hard to tell, so I would like to know the answer. And maybe, again, one of these algorithms will solve the problem and we don't know it yet, so we should probably be uh, working harder on these things. Sorry? Well, the Wang Landau, I would like to see it for myself, I think. So I don't have a good intuition for this one. The parallel tempering I've tried, so I know it fades. The event chain, I haven't tried, but these guys failed several years ago. So who knows? But the Wang Landau, I think I would, I would like to see it. Okay. Anyone interested? Okay, so that's the beginning of uh, lecture two, I think, and we go into this uh, uh, two chapters that are left. So remember that what we are doing in these lectures is essentially uh, giving you methods to compute all the data that I've shown you in this one figure at the beginning with this configuration and entropy going to zero or decreasing fast as you decrease the temperature in this house sphere system. So we've looked at the configurational entropy by the uh, potential energy landscape. I told you there are two other ways to get to there. One is the Franz Parisi potential V of Q that Julio has heavily discussed, and that's what I'm going to do now. And the second is through the point to set correlation length. So these are the two things I would like to explain today. So you know everything about these things because it's been ex explained in previous uh, lectures. But I will just show you how we try to measure those guys in computer simulations and how I think about them from the point of view of, you know, uh, finite dimensional systems. So the Franz Parisi potential, as uh, Julio introduced, it's a kind of a Landau free energy for glasses. So it looks like a Landau free energy. So expressed as a function of Q. Q is this overlap function. So I have to tell you how to measure free energy and I have to define the overlap between the configurations. So let's be just uh, explicit about how we do it in practice. So the construction is like this. You, so you take uh, a reference equilibrium configurations. Okay, so you, you call it C A. You can put a bar if you prefer. And I will call it and designing by the position of each of the particles. And to me, the reference configurations will be copy one of the system. So now I take a second copy of the same system. So it, it means that the particles in the second copy will interact with the same Hamiltonian. So that copy will be C. And you know, the positions of the particles would be called by uh, R2. So I have now my two copies. One is a fixed, it's a reference configuration. It will be the quench disorder in the problem. And then I have to evolve the second configuration in the presence of that quench uh, disorder. So the overlap I, I have already defined. So the overlap between the two copies. Okay, so this is Q1, 2. 
And that's the function which I have uh, defined earlier in the time domain. So now I do it for two copies of the system. So it's a sum of uh, uh, the positions of all the particles. And I introduce this theta function with a microscopic length scale. So how do I put the indices? R1 minus R2 j like this okay so that's the overlap okay so a is this coarse graining length which is a fraction of the particle diameter which i have mentioned before so this is a coarse graining length and so r r R1i is the position of particle i in the copy 1 of the system, and then uh, R2j is the position of co particle j in copy 2. Okay, so it means that you look at the density profiles in copy 1, and you try to decide whether the density profile in copy 2 is the same, and notice that this uh, is a double sum of uh, i and j, so you don't really care who is sitting at which place, provided that you have a particle at the same position. This function theta will be 1, same position within an A uh, amplitude, that theta function will be one and then the overlap will be large. So if you have identical configuration, this guy by definition is one. If you have totally uncorrelated uh, configuration, this guy is very small. So I should write it. One if one is equal to two. And this guy is almost zero if one and two are uncorrelated. And in reality, because you have this uh, volume, the, the uh, random value, it's not really a zero, but it's essentially given by the density, so you won't be able to see it. So the random value, and that's something that I answered wrong to Leo the other day. So the, uh, so for uncorrelated, Q12 is something like four pi, And so for densities that we typically use, which are of other one, this number is uh, 0.03, so it's almost zero. So we should subtract this uh, uh, connected part from the correlation function, but it's irrelevant. How much does the particular detail have overlap with theta? You mean the theta function or the cross graining length? Well, but you could imagine rather than a theta function, well, you could use an exponential or Gaussian something. I haven't tried many. This one is nice because it's zero one, so it's simple to compute. I hope nothing depends too much on the, the, the details of that function. I have played a lot with this A number and our discussions you know, between ourselves about what to do about A, but you know, it's complicated. But within a narrow range, it's robust. <laughs> No, these are, you take two configurations and you compare them. You don't even need to I don't even need to tell you where they come from. This is how I compare the density profiles between two configurations. So this is the picture I drew the other day with the spikes that are, you know, uh, I could do it again if you want the, okay. And how do you define uh, equilibrium configuration? How do you define equilibrium configurations? So that was the beginning of lecture two. H how do I decide that the, uh, algorithm has reached thermal equilibrium. So I do all the tests, at the time it's complicated, I succeed, and then any configurations produced is equilibrium by definition. Okay? So what does this statement explain? Well, it's just that this, I said zero, it's not really zero, and you should, you should subtract that random number to make a function that decays between one and zero, between full correlation and full decorrelation. The other day, I think you asked, you shouldn't you subtract something from your correlation function to make it connected? And I said no, and that was stupid. Okay, yeah. So I'm trying to correct this uh, small mistake. Okay, so now we want to look at the free energy. So we want to construct something which is the free energy. And V of Q, by definition, then is the free energy, the average free energy. System two. 
having an overlap Q with the copy one. And then you do the average of a uh, copy one. So it's really how much it costs in terms of a free energy for the two copies to have an overlap Q and Q is not necessarily zero in one, it's a function now. So we want to measure how the free energy depends on Q continuously. Okay. Uh, so I'll go to the other ball. So let me define things and tell you how we do it in practice. Okay, so this is uh, too small. Uh, so what do I have here? So in one of the definitions that Julio has written down for this free energy, you have that the probability distribution function of the overlap measured at any given temperature, it's really given by exponential of this free energy. Okay, so that's one way of uh, accessing this free energy. So you just relate the, 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 the fluctuations to the free energy at the potential Q. So that's how we'll be measuring the free energy. We'll be measuring the fluctuations of the overlap. And just by taking the log of these fluctuations divided by beta n, we'll get access to V of Q. So of course, e here comes the problem that in the liquid, as uh, we heard before, the typical overlap between configurations is typically very small. So if you want to construct the entire function uh, P of Q, you have to access large values of Q, which are extremely unlikely. So how unlikely are they? So if this number is of order one and you have a few hundreds of particles in your simulations, typically this probability distribution function at large Q will be given by exponential minus 300, something like this. So the probability to observe the fluctuations of overlap at large values of the overlap in the liquid for a few hundreds of particles are something like 10 to the minus 100. Very difficult to do. Yeah, I will write it down, uh, so don't worry, wait one minute, you'll have your answer, okay? So this is uh, what uh, we have to do. So we have to measure these very uh, unlikely um, uh, fluctuations. So maybe I should answer your question. So the way I will, uh, so I will just invert the thing and we'll take this uh, averages like this. So normally in a simulation, you would record the fluctuations of the overlap. So you would have this delta function Q minus Q12. Okay, and so you want to average over thermal fluctuations for the copy two. So that will be something like exponential minus beta H of configura configuration two. And then you would have an average over. So that's taking the thermal average for the configuration two at fixed configuration one. So you want the free energy, so you want to take the log of this guy and you have minus beta n to take the free energy. So all this is taken at fixed configuration one. So this is the free energy at fixed reference configuration one, and then you have to do the average over these reference configurations. So you have to take the average over the quench disorder if you want. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, so you take the reference configurations, you do, the, uh, uh, you do your, your measurements of the fluctuations, then you take the log to go to this V of Q, and then you do the disorder average. You scale it, and that's what you have to measure. So it's not a small thing because you have to, to measure these very unlikely fluctuations, and then you have to do a disorder average at the end. So it's not a, a very simple and easy simulation, but it can be done. Okay, so that's the disorder average. Okay, so the question is, how do you do to access these fluctuations that never happens because the probability to observe them spontaneously is too small? Well, you have to force them, and that's uh, what we'll do. Okay, so maybe just to connect to Julio, so the mean field behavior, how, how was it? Okay, so that's maybe the fifth or sixth time you see similar pictures of uh, the mean field behavior of this uh, free energy, but I do it nevertheless. Okay, so this is the behavior of V of Q in mean field. And we just saw it in the lecture by uh, Florent. Okay, 
So why do you expect in mean field, you expect something that is totally trivial at high temperature? Okay, there was one temperature that was uh, particular in this mean field approach. It was the temperature where the system was developing this uh, spinodal. So that uh, was the dynamical transition in the language of Julio, I think. So that's the mode coupling transition, as we heard many times already. Then below this dynamical transition, you have something like a local minimum. So that's in between. And at the Kurtzman transition, you would have something like this. So that's the uh, mean field description again of the glass transition that we saw many, many times. So it You're right, thanks. Like this. So that's uh, the mean field picture. So if you notice, something must be happening between high temperature and uh, the dynamical one. It means that the free energy must cease to have something, to have convexity. So that's the first temperature at which something like this will appear. We call it the onset. Okay, it's when you start to lose convexity in mean field, but you don't have uh, um, a zero derivative uh, yet. So you lose convexity here. Okay, and the onset temperature is, of course, a very important temperature, right, Patrick? Um, okay, so that's the mean field picture. So what would you expect for finite dimensions? We talked about that uh, uh, already. Okay, so what would you expect for finite, sorry, for finite dimensions? So you go back to finite dimensions and you know that free energies cannot be uh, non-convex. So it means that you know these local minima they cannot really exist. And Julio went in into uh, the details of creating an interface and making this uh, uh, free energy uh, normal in finite dimensions. So th what's going to happen that in finite dimension this guy cannot really exist, and you'll have something like the construction of an interface, and this is what you would expect. Okay, so this mean field the local minimum cannot exist. It would create an interface. It would reduce the free energy of the intermediate region here, and this is what you could expect at best in finite dimensions if the mean field scenario has some relevance. So if you want to make the free energy convex, you also have to do this construction at the mode coupling transition, okay? But you also have to do it at higher temperature because it has to be convex everywhere. So you have to do this constructions up to the onset now, okay? So if something like this is true in finite dimensions, it means that at high temperature, you have this Gaussian-like uh, type of fluctuations. And below this onset temperature that we have not discussed so much uh, in the previous lectures, you should start to see something like the development of a straight line in this uh, free energy. And then these guys should essentially decrease. And at the Kurtzman transition, if you're lucky, you should see something like a flat free energy and a jump of the other parameter like this. So of course, as I told you uh, last time, we cannot really access temperatures that are low enough to cross the Kaltzman. So the red curve is the best we can expect from finite dimensional simulations. So it means in particular that with the Franz Parisi potential, while in mean field we have a clear signature of the mode coupling transition at the mean field level, in finite dimensions we don't expect a large signature through the Franz Parisi potential. It means that the physics of the MCT transition or the dynamical transition is completely gone in finite dimensions if you view it from the point of view of the Franz Parisi potential. Okay. So one more thing I could, uh, I could probably change the blackboard and go over there. <coughs> Okay, so maybe one consequence also of this mean field picture is uh, the following. So if you look at the uh, free energy that has a local minimum here, 
for instance, you take a temperature which is in between the dynamical and the Kurtzman transition, and you have this local minimum here. Imagine that you add something like a field. So you perturb your Hamiltonian, and you add a field which is conjugate to the overlap. Okay, so you add a field epsilon, which tends to favor large values of Q, such that the, the, the energy would be decreased at larger values of Q. So you're adding to your Hamiltonian something that favors large Q values now. So it means that this uh, free energy will be tilted towards large Qs by this term, which is linear in Q. Okay? So you take this local um, uh, minimum, that's not the global one, but you start to tilt it with the field. So there will be a moment, a critical field for which this local minimum will become the global one, and you will induce a jump in the uh, overlap because you apply at constant temperature above the Kurtzman transition a field conjugate to the overlap. So if you go through the details, and that's in the original paper by Franz Parisi, it means that you can induce a first order transition with the field epsilon. So the phase diagram then looks like this. And it's a direct consequence of the other one over there. So if you have temperature and you have the field epsilon, so if you start from the Kurtzman transition, the local minimum is already almost the global one. So the field that you have to apply is zero. So at epsilon equal to zero, the transition is at the Kurtzman transition. If you're slightly above, you have to apply a finite field. And then the phase diagram looks something like this. Okay, and it ends somewhere because I told you that at high temperature, the free energy becomes convex naturally. So you can tilt it, it will stay Gaussian. And then you cannot induce a phase transition anymore. And so this line of first order transition ends at a second order critical point. So that's second order. And this is first order. Okay. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> so that's what I wrote here. You perturb the Hamiltonian and you add the field conjugate to Q. Do you do that in case? Sorry? Do you do that in case? Yes, I do. Okay. So why do we do this and why is it interesting at all? The reason was in again in Julio's lecture. If you remember the interpretation of the free energy difference between the low Q and the high Q uh, uh, local minima that was directly related to the configurational entropy. Okay, so it means that by just by looking at this Franz Parisi potential within the mean field theory, this guy is exactly the configurational entropy, which within mean field is really the log of the number of metastable states that can be defined within mean field. Okay, so we know that in finite dimensions, we've learned that in finite dimensions, these guys cannot be defined anymore, but the Franz Parisi potentials can be defined, and so this free energy difference can be defined, and that function can be measured. So it means that this free energy difference is probably the closest thing you could think of in finite dimensions that is close enough to the mean field definition of the configurational entropy, which is the thing that really goes to zero at the Kurtzman transition. So that's one way that I will use later to access the configurational entropy. And a way that's nearly equivalent is I told you about this field epsilon, which is the energy you have to impose to tilt that potential. So it's, it should be clear to you that this uh, uh, critical value of the field, this line of first order transition, so this uh, epsilon star value, if you wish. So epsilon star. It's also a good proxy for the configurational entropy because this is how much you have to tilt your potential to make it the second minimum, uh, the global one. So this approach then, it's, it's really equivalent, but it gives you two ways numerically in practice in finite dimensions to define and measure the configurational entropy in a way that's really, really close to the mean field the calculations where everything is well defined and you can talk about those states. Okay, so we get for free these two estimates of the configurational entropy. So this guy A, I mentioned before, it takes care of the vibrations. And if you think about this overlap, where you can really switch the position of two particles uh, in, in the, the configuration, and that doesn't change the value of the overlap, you realize that it takes care of the mixing entropy problem that I mentioned before. So it means the mixing entropy problem that we still haven't solved uh, for the potential energy landscape approach 
it, it's not even a problem within the France Parisi because this free energy difference is finite by constructions directly and you don't even have to think about it. And we had not thought about it when we did it, by the way. Okay, so it takes care of the mixing entropy. Okay, so it, it, it's neat, it's clean. It's an entropy. It has an interpretation of how much does it cost you to localize the system in just one state, even though you don't even need to define states anymore. And it works in finite dimension. So that's why we like it. Okay. So now practical measurements and results. Yes. During our simulation, yes. how do we calculate Q? Like, do we have to have a previous simulation without that coupling that from which we know the equilibrium conservation? So, we have that um, so let me answer the question by telling you what I do, and I think that question will not even be uh, necessary. I hope, at least. If it's necessary, you ask it again. Okay, so we want to access this unlikely fluctuation. So how, so how to bias the simulation towards unlikely sim uh, I think the answer is given in the question because we have to bias the simulation. Yes. So I think what I'm saying is that the overlap is, is defined as uh, not a sum of a single particle, but the you can switch the particle. So when you do your simulations and you explore large queues, if you want that the overlap between copy one and two is large, you can you know you can have all the swaps you like. In the, and the all, all the configurations that are allowed by the equilibrium distribution, they contribute to this uh, free energy here. Okay, so if it means that in practice, if uh, the particle diameters are really different, it will never happen that you will never probe configurations where one big particle is sitting where a very small one is in config. And if the size difference is intermediate, it may happen a little bit. And if it's very close, it will happen a lot of time. But this is taken care by sampling equilibrium at large Q in a Q that does not decide about the particle diameters. So, so there is no factorial and nothing in the calculation. I don't know. Let me think about okay, that one. Sure. Okay, so how do you access uh, these uh, fluctuations? You have to bias your simulations, and that's uh, the key word. So you just do a simulation with a bias that favors these fluctuations that you should not see, but then you will see them, and then you have to reconstruct the equilibrium distribution. Okay? So that doesn't look good. It's 10 to the minus 100, and so you have to use. Uh, Monte Carlo simulations again in a more clever way. Okay, so what's good in Monte Carlo is you really uh, decide at the very start what type of uh, priority distribution function you want to sample with your algorithm. So you can decide to uh, change the priority distribution function to probe something else. Okay, so that's what you do. So the method that you use, it's called umbrella sampling. Okay, so I will use it in the context of this configurational entropy, but it's a general method to measure uh, free energies in whatever system you like. Okay, so the idea is you bias the equilibrium distribution. So essentially, you change by hand the Hamiltonian you want to sample. 
but you bias it by a known amount, by a known amount. Okay, so you do your simulation. With this bias, you measure the fluctuations and then you unbias the results, and that's it. That's very simple. Okay, so in practice, what uh, did I do? And I just took, uh, you know, you read papers about umbrella sampling. Many people do many different types of things. I'm not sure I've done the best thing, but it works, so I stop there. And maybe that could be optimized, I don't know. Okay, so in practice, what I did for this particular curve, so I changed the Hamiltonian of the system to the unperturbed Hamiltonian, if you wish, and I just added a bias that's very trivial, that's just a harmonic oscillator. So instead of just letting the overlap fluctuate as it wants in the, uh, um, the simulations, I just add a term with the constant k0 and q0 that I decide, I chose, these are my input, my choices if you want. And if you want, you, you say that if you want to decrease the Hamiltonian here, you want the overlap to be close to the value q0 that you impose. So if you impose a large value of Q0 to minimize the energy developed between, between configurations one and two, needs to be large. So this term is going to favor large overlap values. Okay, so it favors Q1 to close to Q0 such that this term is zero and you minimize uh, the energy. So you bias with uh, this uh, term, it favors large Q fluctuations you do your simulations with this perturbation, so you will sample large values of the overlap by construction. So you measure your P of Q now, okay? So you measure P of Q12, well, in the presence of all this uh, mass, so at Q0, K0, ta ta ta. So this is the bias simulations. You measure the fluctuations in equilibrium in the presence of the bias. So you have your probability distribution here. And if you want to recover the original distribution, you just have to unbias the distribution. So the truth, so let me call this guy P, well, I call it W because I call this term W0 of Q. So let me call W this uh, harmonic potential. And so this is the uh, probability distribution in the presence of the uh, harmonic bias, Q, uh, P of uh, W. And then the real P of Q, the one that you'd like to measure without the, bia the bias, is related to P of the value of Q. And then you have to divide by the Boltzmann weight of this harmonic oscillator. Okay, zero. Okay, so you measure something. And the true thing is that thing multiplied by this exponential factor that's going to kill the fluctuation. So that's, uh, in a sense, this term is promoting the fluctuations and you can get it. Okay. So that's uh, the basic idea. Oops. Okay, so graphically, this is how it looks. If you look at the log of P of Q, typically in an ordinary simulation, you will do 10 to the 5, 1 million steps, so you'll have a distribution that covers something like six decades. Okay, so that will be something like uh, six decades. So you do your ordinary simulation without any, bi in any bias, and you have something like this. So this is the ordinary so without the bias, you would measure in log log something that probably looks like a Gaussian. You're not too sure what the tails look like. You have something like six orders of magnitude. Now you do your simulation with the bias on, so this function PW, okay, so that would be 
uh, I don't know, this is a log scale, so I can put it anywhere. So that's Q. And then you decide that Q0 is somewhere here. Okay, you say, I will, I'm going to bias the simulations towards uh, Q0. So you'll find Gaussian looking fluctuations around Q0. Okay. So that would be the function P of W of Q. It would be Gaussian fluctuations around Q0. And then you unbias the result. So you take this uh, yellow thing, you divide, you multiply by this uh, Boltzmann weight. And the unbiased thing, uh, I'll put it green. So you see that it's defined. Oh. Okay, I should, I should say it's proportional to this because you don't know how to normalize it because you don't have the entire distribution yet. So I can put it anywhere vertically, but it, it's going to look something like this. Okay, so this is the unbiased. And you should think of this part as being the tail of this guy, but you don't know how to put it vertically yet. And that's what we are going to do in a minute. Okay, so we have been able to compute a little bit of this distribution deep in the tail, but we have to still adjust the normalization. And normalization will come when we have the entire distribution. Where was the question? Yes. Uh, is it minus beta k0 or plus beta k? I thought about it while writing, and then I, I decided it was minus. But I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a minus because it has to suppress everything. But, but, uh, but I, I, I it, um, it, 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 it looks like a plus to me, but I want it to suppress. So I'm not too sure, but it, I think it's a plus. Um, and I don't have it in my notes, I have to say. So let's put the plus and think about it uh, while I continue. Mm -hmm. So, but whether plus, well, okay, whether plus or minus, it's either a gigantic number. Yes. And in the end, you try to divide out this bias. Yes, exactly. It's some, uh, it's some 10 to the minus 100 that you were talking yeah, about. Yes, so you multiply by 10 to the minus 100, it becomes visible, and then you divide again. And, and the key is that you know this is equilibrium Boltzmann distribution, so you know what you're doing to the distribution, you know to unbias it. It's just uh, because it's the magic of equilibrium it's, it's, th it's the knowledge of the Boltzmann distribution, that's it. Are there pitfalls to watch out for? <laughs> you mean mistakes to be made? Well, it's, okay, so it's time to maybe, yes. Um, I started doing it completely differently. I use this, it's called multi-canonical distributions where you try to guess in an iterative manner how to unbias the entire distribution. And that's very subtle and complicated. And I failed to make it work. And then I found papers by people I know are extremely efficient. They were using this divide and conquer method. You divide into small pieces, you do it by harmonics, and it works. And it took me half, an, you know, half a day just to code and do and get the results. So I say, OK. So this method is brute force. That's why I'm saying it's probably not the most efficient, most elegant, ta ta ta, ta But it's, it has to work because you bias and you unbias, and you divide into small pieces, you know. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the final. Uh, so we have just a piece of this uh, tail. We need to reconstruct the entire tail. So we'll use several k0, q0 values, and I will answer that question. Do you do again multiple times for different epsilon values also? Do you do what? Sorry. Do you do the same procedure for different epsilon values also? Well, I, I will come to epsilon uh, later. That was uh, her question. So for for now, I have just done a little bit of the curves, and I want to do it uh, all soon. <coughs> no. I mean, it's just a trick to favor these very unlikely fluctuations. You can see them and you divide by, and you, you could put any other potential that favors Q0. I take harmonic because harmonic is simple. Anything would work. You know, you, you could, some function of Q and you then divide by the small the Boltzmann weight with the proper uh, sign of that function of Q. Okay? Could you, I mean, it's a plus, I think, now. Okay. Could you use your biasing to, to get just a flat distribution? 
Yeah, that's what multi-canonical is about. You try to guess, you know, you know something about the distribution at high T, you use that to do the next temperature. It's a good guess and you adjust in an iterative way such that the sampling of the entire Q space is flat. That's how it works and that's what I failed to make work. Because dealing with the entire function was too much, I think, for me. Okay. So we continue this uh, work and you've guessed how it's going to end. So you do this for several, several values of uh, Q0 and then you can access the entire range of uh, Q values that you need to cover. Okay. okay, so I decided it's a plus. Okay, and so what it does, it's really, uh, no, I'm not yet sure. Okay, so you repeat with, you know, as many pairs of Q0 and K0 needed to cover the entire range. So first, the, all the art now is in the choice of, maybe that's an uh, answer to your question, uh, Eric, how do you choose K0 and Q0 so that it works? You try until it works, so, you know, you have no good choice. If you make K0 too big, then it's a very narrow distribution, and then it's very slow. If you make it too big, then it's slow because it's too large. You know, so you, you just play a little bit until it works, and then you forget about it. Okay, and so you get your series of simulations. So each, schematically, each simulation is dealing with a range of Q, like this. So you do your unbiasing, like this, so they were yellow or green, and you get functions that at the end of the day look like this, you know. Pieces of distributions that are not normalized and that float around like this. And all these guys, of course, after reconstructions will form the tail of this function. Okay, so the question is, how do you do? So one thing to do is to shift these guys by hand, you know, and then you reconstruct your distribution just by, you know, piece by piece reconstructing by hand the distribution. And that would work, actually it works uh, beautifully. Okay. So if you do it and you have uh, sufficient overlap between the different simulations, you can just by hand reconstruct your entire distributions and go and reach this 10 to the minus 100 number that you would want it to see at the beginning. Okay, so imagine that you do this, then you take minus log of this guy, multiply it by beta n, normalize and everything, and the inverse of this, okay, will be V of Q. Okay, and so it will look something like this. So it's essentially minus the log of P, so it's really the tilting of this guy and taking now the log uh, out. Okay. Well, I, I told you by the eye, you can do it very successfully. And of course, people do it, by don't do it like this. I will tell you how I do it, though I don't have so much time. So all these things are well known in the context of uh, ordinary phase transitions, and they have been used for decades. Yes, I'm just taking them from, again, uh, reading uh, textbooks, okay? So how to reconstruct the, uh, the distribution? And this morning reading papers, Leo, I realized that one of the guys who did this calculation works in Boulder, Colorado, Michael Schertz. Schertz, something like this. Thanks. You know him? <laughs> it's a guy in uh, here in Boulder in physical chemistry or something who did these calculations. I was wondering with the sorry. Uh, but he's still working here, I think. I saw his web page this morning. Okay, so I was curious. Maybe that you know exactly. It's totally irrelevant. I'm sorry. So it's called histogram reweighting method. So 
So it's a way to best reconstruct the data from a series of uh, piecewise uh, simulations. So I won't go through the papers because, uh, you know, it's well documented even in textbooks. And I will put references about what type of textbooks I was uh, using to do this. So in a sense, what you want to do is you want to reconstruct the distribution P through a series of independent measurements. And so the idea of this histogram weighting is that you have a number of measurements, say small n measurements. In each of these measurements, you have measured the function PI. Okay. And so you estimate for each value of Q, you estimate uh, the you, g you have a contribution that comes from the distribution PI, okay? And the best reconstruction is something that goes like this, okay? Where sigma i squared is typically the error you make in the measurement of PI, okay? So PI is the, me is the measurement, and sigma i is the error on that measurement. Okay, so it sort of makes sense that if the error is small, then you give a lot of weight, of weight to the value of PI that you take. If the error is very big, then you kill the value and it does not contribute to the average, and that's uh, normalization. So that's uh, the ID, and I don't want to go into the derivation and how you go to the final equations, but you use that f those formula that are in textbooks, and then you have the best reconstruction of the data from a series of independent measurements. Okay. So the algebra has been done for you. I can write down the equations just out of uh, curiosity so you have an idea of how you do in practice. So the reconstructed P of Q that you get from your series of measurement, it's something like this, sum over I, i of q, and then the normalization becomes something like this, minus beta. So remember that I introduced w as the harmonic term in the perturbation. So now I label them by i. I have done these uh, n measurements, and so this is how you reconstruct p of q. So these guys are the known uh, biasing uh, Boltzmann weight. These are the measurements, and you have this unknown function zi that looks like partition sums, and you have to compute them uh, uh, in a self-consistent way. And for the problem at hand, it becomes something like, oops, this is not the line, sum over j, so the details don't really matter, but at least you have, uh, oops an idea of uh, the functional forms. Uh, Wi minus Wj divided by Zj. Okay, so initially you don't know the values of Zi, but you put them into the equations again and again until it converges. And at the end of the day, you have all the partition functions. For each value of Q, then you get the uh, expression P of Q. And this is how you do it if you don't want to use your eyes to reconstruct the distribution. So to be solved self-consistently. Uh. Okay, and the outcome of all this business is P of Q, hence V of Q, and that's it. You've done all these series of simulations and you have obtained V of Q for one temperature, so you have to repeat them for different temperatures then. Okay, so what about uh, epsilon? And that was uh, the question at the front. Now that you have P of Q for the entire Q range that's relevant, it's not even needed to do a simulation at finite epsilon. You just use the knowledge of the distribution P of Q. that we've just measured uh, here, and you just reweight it by the Boltzmann distribution. So I think 
I hope now I get the sign right. And then you have to normalize that distribution by just the integral of what's upstairs, dq, p of q, minus beta q epsilon. And then that gives you the, di the fluctuations of q in if you had put a field uh, epsilon in your simulation. So you, you can get the results for free. You don't need to do the simulations. You just take this distribution. You bias it by the Boltzmann weight. And that's the result you would have obtained if you had uh, applied an external field. Okay. So how does this uh, distributions look like as a function of epsilon? So maybe I could sketch them in the middle to have more space. And I hope I have the time to show you the real data uh, at the end. So this P of Q for different epsilon, it looks like this. OK, so we've looked at the log uh, of P. Now I, I look at P in the linear scale. So it means that the distribution at epsilon equals to 0 looks like uh, the Gaussian. And before, we have looked at the tails and this 10 to the minus 100 uh, fluctuations. Once you start to apply a field, is if the field is small, then you have something like this. Uh, that's epsilon small. And then you, we've discussed that you know if the, the temperature is low enough, you'll have this first order phase transition. So it means that at large epsilon, you'll get something like this. This again, a histogram that's peaked towards a large value of Q. And if you apply exactly you know, the epsilon that's in between these two uh, limits of large and small, I have no colors, yeah, red. There will be, you know, within your simulation, there will be a critical value of epsilon, which is epsilon star for this particular temperature, such that the large Q and the low Q coexist. And this is the fluctuations of the other parameter across a first order transition for a finite system size. So this is coexistence, if you wish. So this is the direct signature of phase coexistence between large Q and low Q, this first order transition that I discussed somewhere on that blackboard. And the outcome of all this business is because I have uh, S of Q, then I have this estimate of the configurational entropy by looking at the uh, free energy difference between low Q and large Q. And this guy gives me the second estimate of the configurational entropy uh, by this approach. And that's it. So I have obtained two of the curves of the figure I showed you many times of the configurational entropy decreasing relatively steeply as you compress out spheres. So we've seen last time the potential energy landscape. And here we just got two uh, by the method of uh, the Franz Parisi potential and uh, this uh, epsilon uh, coupling. So we have three curves, and we now we'll go to the fourth one, unless there are questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do the fourth one then. So I think by the end, before the end of the lecture, I will be able to show you these uh, plots uh, directly from my computer. It all looks nice on the blackboard, but this morning I tried to do the, fig the figure on, uh, in the middle blackboard. It was looking like a mess. So I decided not to show that one. I will just show you V of Q. But the real data look a bit uh, noisy. Point set correlation links. Okay, so we close the loop with the uh, discussion of Gilles, Julio, and the computer simulations, and we come back again with this uh, idea of a point set correlation length. So you've been exposed twice to it. So the notation was psi PTS. 
and we heard uh, twice about it. So first in uh, Gilles' lectures. <coughs> so I'll try to repeat what you said without uh, distortion today. <laughs> then I don't get... Uh okay, so Gilles uh, uh, told us about the general idea of measuring the correlation between a point in the liquid and many points uh, uh, outside. So he introduced, I think, some that notation. So he was considering a point, and he was uh, drawing some boundaries in the liquid. And he said, this point to set correlation length is something like I take the sum observable at uh, position R, and I correlate it with some function of these observables uh, measured at the boundaries, I think. And so the idea that he uh, tried to, I think, convey was the idea that we want to compute the correlation between this guy and everybody else outside of this uh, cavity at distance R. Uh, and to him, that was a way of discussing in general term the idea of a static correlation length for liquids. For dense liquids. And because that function depends on many particles at the boundary, then it's, a, it's not a two-body or three-body or four-body uh, correlation function. It's a very uh, large number of uh, you know, uh, terms in this uh, series. So it's, it's a very complicated many-body static correlation length for liquids. And, and then he tried to motivate that it was interesting for liquids. Then Giulio came back to this uh, idea and talked again about the point to set correlation length in the context of random first order transition theory, in the context of a rough OT. So he did again this uh, uh, construction of looking at the cavity. So you have a point, you have a cavity of radius R, and then you freeze the boundary conditions. So Giulio did the calculation that Silvio Franz had done of doing the thermodynamics of the liquid inside that cavity with fixed boundary conditions. And so, for instance, he was measuring the uh, overlap profile as a function of the distance within the cavity, as a function of the radius of the cavity for different temperatures approaching the Kaltzmann transition. So he did this thermodynamic construction, and the idea behind and the interpretation of the point to set correlation length in that business was given by this nucleation argument. So I hope I'm using the very same notations that he used. So he said, if you look at the free energy of the liquid inside that cavity, it has two contributions, as usual. The system would like to visit many states, and then it would gain a lot of configurational entropy. And so in the notations of Julio, V of QEA was essentially this free energy difference that we've just measured by the previous methods. So that's gaining entropy, gaining free energy by visiting many states inside that cavity. But that has a cost, and I think he was using 4 pi r square and this funny letter that I cannot really uh, write uh, as well as he does. So that's some kind of surface tension. If you want to visit many states, then you'll have to pay surface tension at the boundary of the cavity. You minimize that free energy and emerges the point to set correlation length, which if you mi minimize that guy is two time twice the surface tension divided by V of Q E A. Uh, which this guy is essentially, again, uh, the configurational entropy. So within RFOT, the point to set length that Gilles has defined can be interpreted as the inverse of the configurational entropy. And so, uh, as we just uh, said uh, so many times, when this guy is going to go to zero, when the, uh, the, this uh, V of Q is going to be zero at the Kaltzmann transition, it means that this point to set correlation length should diverge. So large correlation lengths means small configuration and entropy in this uh, interpretation. Okay, so all this to say that this is an important correlation length in itself, and on top of it, it gives us access to an estimate of the configuration and entropy. So for these two reasons, 
it's very interesting to try and measure that guy in computer simulation of finite dimensional liquids. Okay, so that's what I do in the last uh, few pages of my notes. Okay, so maybe let me write this sentence. So the point to set correlation length is the important static length scale so it's not contained in the per correlation function in the structure factor in three body quantities it's a very complicated object and the reason why it's complicated is the reason that uh, everybody has repeated uh, ten times already is because this Kaltzmann transition is not about the growth of some uh, well-defined order like ferromagnetic order it's really about the rarefaction of these states that then become correlated about uh, la uh, larger distances. So it's not about the typical uh, positions of the particle, but about the number of configurations that can be accessed. Okay. okay. So how do we do in practice? In practice, it looks uh, simple on paper, and when you want to do it, it's difficult. Okay. So in practice. The idea is uh, relatively simple. You take again your reference configuration. Okay, so it's as before uh, given by uh, the positions of particle uh, R1. And then you do the uh, exact constructions that is done in the theory. So you fixed the positions of the particles. outside the cavity of radius r and then you try to summarize what's inside the cavity okay. so you summarize inside the cavity and that's it that's all you need to do in principle okay. so how do you detect the length provided you're able to thermalize. So imagine that you have thermalized. So the quantity you measure is this overlap between the what's inside the cavity and that's being thermalized and the reference configuration one. And you measure that guy at the center of the cavity. So you measure this overlap just in the middle of your cavity of size uh, R. Okay. So suppose you have done this for one particular realization, then you have to average over the disorder again. Okay, and so you have to average, so you have to summarize, measure, and average as before for the transparency potential, but now this is resolved uh, in space, so it's uh, much uh, harder. And then when you're done with this uh, averaging, you have to repeat for different R value. And when you're done, you have to repeat for different temperatures approaching the glass transition. And that's it. That's how you get the temperature dependence of the point to set correlation length. So you can guess already that it's not so um, easy. It's a bit painful. So assume you succeeded. So what you get is what has been uh, sketched by uh, Julio and Gilles uh, a few times so as a function of the uh, uh, cavity size. So again, this is the overlap as a center of the cavity for a particular temperature as a function of the cavity radius. So we have gone through this many times. So if you're lucky, you'll see that for a large cavity, the system is able to sample many, many states in a very uh, easy way. So that's large cavity, and you have many possible states to sample. They are different from the initial configurations, and the overlap between the initial configuration and these very many states, it's, it will be very small. 
When you reach very small cavities, then the system is totally blocked. It cannot sample other configurations because it would cost too much uh, uh, in surface energy to the system to do. So essentially, the system is blocked. It's just one state. And so it's essentially sampling the initial reference configuration, and it has a large overlap uh, with it. Okay? So you have a transition between the system accessing many states towards the system being blocked and totally uh, uh, unable to sample many different states. And so the crossover between these two is what's defining uh, the pod to set correlation length. Okay, so if you want, just by watching the decay with R of this overlap function, you could define by fitting or something the point to set uh, correlation length. Okay, so that's one way uh, of doing it. So of course we can do uh, a bit better than this. So one, let me. So many states we write it. Okay. So what we could do instead of measuring just Q, we could measure the entire probability distribution function of Q. Okay, so let's see how it looks. And if we are very close to the Kaussmann transition, we could imagine the following behavior. Okay, so we said when we have a large cavity size, the fluctuations will be too, uh, close to uh, small values of Q. So this again, this is a sketch. So this is R much larger than the point to set correlation length. When the cavity size is very small, you have just one state, the overlap is big and does not fluctuate a lot. Okay, so that would be R much smaller than the point to set length. Okay. And in between the system may be hesitating between, you know, do I sample many states or am I blocked within one state? And we may expect to see something like this. Okay. It's looking again like a, a smooth crossover between, you know, large Q, low Q, but all this is happening within, you know, a finite number of particles. So it's like a rounding first order transition. And if you think one second about it, it's like, you know, by decreasing R here, the system explores many states. It has less and less states, and suddenly, click, it's blocked into one state. So in a sense, decreasing R is very much like decreasing the temperature for the bulk system where you have less and less entropy and at the Kurtzman transition you're blocked within one state. So the crossover that you see at the point to set correlation length, it looks like a Kurtzman transition. It's like losing states and took suddenly you have no states anymore. So that's why when we started to work on this with Patrick and others that are watching the, the movie, we call this a baby Kurtzman transition. Okay, because it has the flavor of a Kurtzman transition, but for a finite, numbers of parti finite number of particles within a finite size cavity. So it's a rounded Kurtzman transition, but it, it has the flavor uh, nonetheless. Okay, and if the fluctuations of Q are Gaussian, Gaussian and bimodal, it means that if you define a function like chi, so I should have said this is for a cavity size which is of the order of the point set, so you could look at the fluctuations of this uh, overlap and define their variance, something like this. And you would expect that the fluctuations would be small, large, small as you cross the uh, uh, point to set correlation length. So as a function of R, you would expect some kind of a maximum, again, at the point to set correlation length. So the decay of Q is nice, but if you look at the fluctuations of Q, the variance or the entire distribution, they tell you exactly where the point to set correlation length uh, is. And that's how we uh, now quantify the point to set correlation um, in the simulations by watching not only Q, but the fluctuations of Q. Okay. So that's the idea behind, you know, how do you get the number out of the simulations? But I said it's providing you can summarize those uh, systems and really access the fluctuations of Q in small cavities in equilibrium conditions. And I said it's a baby Kaltzman transition, okay? So there is no way that you can sample this efficiently.
it has to be difficult because you have less and less states, so the system doesn't know where to go, it goes nowhere. Okay. Okay. So there have been lots of measurements of the point to set correlation length. So we know we have tests to decide whether the overlap has reached some equilibrium, whether we have summarized different cavities. I won't explain those tests today, but we know how to decide whether we do a good job or not, and we know how to decide how long it takes. Okay? So we can measure how long it takes to reach equilibrium for a given R and a given temperature. So we can do this test and then we extract the time scale, which is the time it takes to reach some equilibrium. So let me call this time uh, tau, uh, no name. So it's the time with no name. Okay. So this is the cavity size and this is the point to set correlation length as defined by the previous uh, measurements. So you take your ordinary Monte Carlo simulation, you do whatever you know you want, and that time goes like this. Okay, that's ordinary Monte Carlo simulation. You take your cavity, you try to sample, you look how long it takes for the overlap to reach equilibrium, and that time is exploding way before the point to set correlation length. Okay, now you say. I have introduced this swap algorithm that speeds up uh, everything, so you use it. It does speed up everything, but it dies before the point to set correlation length we found. Okay? So I should mention and make this uh, joke now. So I look at the camera, and the guy who did the work is watching the lectures online every day. So it's Sho Yaida. So hi, Sho. <laughs> Okay, so he was the one doing the actual work, and I know he's watching. He will be watching in uh, one hour, maybe. Okay, so he found that if you use the swap, the time scale is really exploding, and there is no way you can cross and reach the point to set correlation length. So no way you can do it with ordinary and swap Monte Carlo simulations. For our system, I should say, because people have claimed they can do it for another system, and we don't know whether it's true or not, because we haven't checked their exact system. So the way we did it is by inventing an algorithm that goes across this, and this is this parallel tempering method I alluded to uh, a f um, half an hour ago. And this is what Shaw has been able to do, so he has used parallel tempering. So I will uh, take two minutes to explain how it works, but the outcome of this parallel tempering is that it's much better than the swap, and it can access this region of small cavities below the point to set correlation. It means that using this parallel tempering, we can measure this, this, and this, and extract the point to set correlation in conditions that we believe are really truly uh, equilibrium. And that was the key to unlock. So that's a case where the parallel tempering is really much better than the swap uh, alone. And I believe for the uh, bulk system, it's the other way around. The parallel tempering shoots up, and the swap is much faster. I had not realized that before preparing the lectures, but uh, now I understand. Okay, so what uh, did uh, show? Uh, so there are many ideas. So how do you use uh, parallel tempering? So we use. Okay, so let's see. It's the end of the note, so it's uh, you know barely sentences. So we simulate. Uh, n copies of the system in parallel. So let me call them C1, C, and so we have this uh, n copies of this uh, um, confined uh, liquid within the same uh, cavity. So they all have the same Hamiltonian. Okay, and 
that's not exactly what we did, but for the explanation, it's good. So each copy is evolving at a different temperature, so T1 up to Tn, such that T1 and C1 represent the conditions at which you want to do the measurements. Okay, so this is the original system. The blue is horrible. So I make it, uh, I don't know, green. So this is the original system. Okay, so it has the right uh, temperature. So if you imagine that T1 is smaller than T2, smaller than Tn, and Tn is very large, it means that the temperature here is very large. Okay, so you evolve your system in the copy N at a very high temperature, so the dynamics there will be very fast. And then thermalization there will be easy. So you do your simulations in parallel and for them to be useful from time to time. Okay, from time to time. You attempt to exchange two copies. copy i and copy i plus one. Okay, and you accept or reject this uh, exchange with the uh, detailed balance condition. So let me, I cannot erase this one, so I go to the other one. Okay, so the end of the algorithm over there is you accept or reject It's a detailed balance condition. Okay, so if all of the copies and the exchange between the copies satisfy detailed balance, you're safe, you reach equilibrium, you're bound to reach equilibrium, and then you can extract the measurements by watching the last copy, uh, copy number one. And that's the key, that's really the key to summarize this system. Okay, so if you can thermalize for different radii, you get Q over P of Q, da, da, da. and at the end of the day, you get the point to set correlation length as defined in the middle board that gives you an estimate for the inverse of the configurational entropy, which is the fourth uh, estimate of the configurational entropy I showed you uh, in the slide. Okay. So let me finish by now. Uh, showing you again the results now that you know how these results were obtained. Uh, disappeared. Uh, this one. I know what it is. I think it's okay. Let me. No. I think it's okay. I should have done this uh, slightly earlier. Wake up. Sorry? Say that again. So that was the black bar that's uh, below this. So we measure Q of R, we fit the decay, for instance. We get the fluctuations of Q, we get a peak. That's uh, the point to set correlation length. That's not your question. Yes? Okay, I understand. Is it working? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me connect and then I take your question. But it's not written uh, boulder or something. No? Once you connect okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so if I want to measure the point to set correlation length at temperature T1, for instance, I would set the lowest temperature in my chain here as being T1, and then all these temperatures would be higher. And so I do the measurements at this final temperature. And these are useless for my equilibrium measurement. They are just a way to access the equilibrium distribution there. 
Okay, because I have some time, I should say that thi this is not what Shaw uh, did in the simulations. He actually didn't change the temperature, but it changed the, radi the radius of the particles within the cavity. So he was e effectively changing the density as you increase. Uh, what? So he changed both the diameters and the temperature. I should have remembered. Thank you. Uh, so where are we? Yes. Uh, I didn't answer. What, can you repeat again? Yeah. So the small particle then they can move very easily in the cavity. The temperature is high, so the dynamics is fast, and it helps this guy thermalizing. Okay. So a few figures before uh, we close. So that's the Franz Parisi potential measured in hard sphere. So that's as a function of the overlap, <coughs> and this is the equilibrium packing fraction of those systems. So as you go from blue to red, the packing fraction is increasing. You go closer and closer to the glass transition. And this is the measure of the free energy profile. And at this uh, value, we decided to measure the free energy difference. So we took this height here as an estimate, as a proxy for the configurational entropy of the system. And the reason why we pick this thing is that you, if you observe the convexity of the function, it's for this system, it's almost so someone asked about the Maxwell construction in finite dimensions. So here we are way below the dynamical mat coupling transition, and you don't see anything like a local minimum. At best, what you see is something that looks like a straight line here. So this is what you asked about the, the Maxwell construction. And if you look at the blue curve here, it's really not uh, linear at all. So you see the emergence of this linear part, which is the only signature you have in this uh, finite dimensional system. So we pick this value of the overlap not totally randomly. Because we also looked at what's happened if you bias and you add a field conjugate to the overlap and you introduce this uh, transition at finite epsilon. So this is the plot I was uh, trying to make uh, earlier. So this is the uh, distribution of the overlap when the uh, epsilon field is zero. So if you take the log of this guy and you look at this state here and you come back to it, uh, so this tail would become this in V of Q. So now we, you know, we undo the log and we look at P of Q in linear scale. So this is this uh, distribution at low Q. And now you increase the value of epsilon. And there is an epsilon value where the distribution becomes bimodal. This is where you have coexistence between large Q and low Q. And if you increase epsilon further, then the high Q thing is going to win. So this is the first order transition in the epsilon plane. And then this uh, phase coexistence here, the blue thing is giving us an idea of the epsilon. This is one of the measurements in the curve. OK, so these are the data collected by uh, Shaw uh, watching the movie. So this is cavity size. This is uh, overlap as a function of uh, uh, this cavity size for, again, uh, packing fractions approaching the glass transition. So each of these points results from these very large numbers of simulations using parallel tempering, swap algorithm for different radii, average over a lot of cavities. It's an enormous amount of work. Um, so it's uh, cool that uh, we've been able to do it. And maybe just to rebound on uh, Gilles' remarks, look at the typical sizes that we get at the end. It's not a huge growth of the static correlation length, but it's a growth nonetheless. So we work a lot to extract this number for the point to set correlation length, and then we, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a subliminal thing. And then we collect uh, everything on this uh, figure, and you have your four estimates of the configurational entropy. So I repeat what I said in the first lecture. So the blue thing here is really the total entropy minus the vibrational coming from partitioning the potential energy landscape, a lot inherent structure. And this is uh, uh, the old method, and it seems to be going to zero rather sharply at a you know, finite pressure, finite temperature for this system. So now we have these two estimates that comes from the Franz Parisi potential, so the free energy difference or this uh, critical epsilon value. So this is the green, and this is the green, and they coincide quantitatively. We don't have to uh, play around with the numbers. And if you are very careful, you realize that 
this delta V here, it stops to exist here. It means that for higher temperature, if you wish, we don't find a transition in the epsilon uh, uh, temperature plane. And it means we don't know how to define the free energy difference between the high Q and the low Q thing because the function is convex. So there is no high Q, no low Q. So this is, in a sense, the location of this uh, critical point that I mentioned before. Above that critical point, the epsilon transition is no longer defined. And the, in a sense, the states are no longer present. And we shouldn't even think about configuration and entropy above these temperatures, by the way. And the third thing here is the point to set correlation length. That's, again, when normalized by some arbitrary number, gives us an estimate for the configuration and entropy. And at low enough temperature, it has the same uh, temperature dependence. So I think I have been able to explain this uh, figure in quite some detail. And that's all we did in this uh, for, uh, I don't know, in these three lectures. So you realize that in principle, to get access to these uh, things, you have learned uh, something about MD, about MC, umbrella sampling, parallel tempering, stat mech, theory of the glass transition, and liquid state theory. And that was the content of uh, my lectures. So these things, of course, they are not useful just to produce one curve, I hope. And they will be useful for glasses in general. I haven't talked about aging and rheology, but I like them a lot. And all these things, of course, are methods that you would use in uh, any computer simulations, polymers, jets of matter, biophysics, etc. Thank you. The justification in terms of what? What, what are so you asking? Why, why, why does it allow you to reach the, the equilibrium average? Well, what I told you that if you just simulate this guy, right. it's totally blocked. It's totally frozen. The particles don't move at this temperature. So I know, I, I'm, I'm talking about because you, you, have, you, have, you now have some data from higher temperatures. Yeah. So what's, what's happening is that the, the particles that are here, they don't move, and the particles that evolve with this temperature, they move a lot, and they sample the very different states. So provided you, you know, exchange these guys very, uh, you know, for a large number of times, you have the possibility that what's moving here is helping you to move there. That's the physical intuition behind that. But that, me that measurement, me, you know, it means nothing in terms of what I want to access. So I, I don't even measure anything this. Okay, so you just use it to move. Yeah, so it's a trick. Uh, but he started, but nobody listened, so I don't, I don't know. Maybe we should stop and take the questions later. I don't know. You decide, Patrick. Okay, so A, B. No, so the blue curve, I think, doesn't agree because the way it thinks about state is very different from the other ones. So these ones, they are close to the idea of free energy, metastable states, even though, you know, it's not well defined. This one is supposedly counting the number of energy minima. And these things that we are trying to count by various approximations, they are different things. So conceptually, this group of three and this one, they are conceptually different. So the fact that they give different results is not too surprising. We believe that we should have very many more, uh, many more energy minima as compared to free energy minima. So perhaps the entropy is bigger, you know, but there are so many approximations behind these ideas that I'm not sure that what I said is the reality. Sure, but then you have one configuration. What I want to see is, uh, in a sense, uh, sample configuration space for the cavity at fixed boundary conditions. I have to sample very many configurations. And it's true that if the cavity size is small, I just do, you know, I cannot sample any other uh, configurations because they cost me too much, you know, in terms of the free energy. While well, when the cavity is there, then I sample very, very many configurations at fixed boundary conditions. So you have to try to sample to decide whether you can or not. Yes. So if I wanted to, to look at the upper bound of the green curve, one, no, yeah. I can't tell the colors from here. But once it starts to stop at DC, 
Yes, here. And I wanted to think about what, what, where that is in an experimental system. What would I think about? This guy? Yeah. This guy is essentially the mud coupling transition. Okay, so that would be the onset, and that guy would be the mud coupling transition. That would be your TG, and that would be your T Kurtzman. I know what's coming. Yes. But it works really well to thermalize cavities. Yes. But at some point, doesn't the cavity get really large? And so what yeah, but at the same time, when the cavity gets very large, it's when the system has access to very many states. So it's not very difficult there. Okay. So okay. That, that's when, if you do in, if you do simultaneously swap and parallel tempering, as you go to large cavities, then the swap is helping you. And at small cavities, the swap is killed, but then you have parallel tempering. So that's, you know, you, you're good on both ends of this uh, curve, in a sense. Okay. So are we saying we can get the overlap at the center of the cavity? So we imagine kind of like a cutoff gradient, like a small moment? Yeah, so uh, the details are in the papers. I haven't looked carefully, but what we take is we take a small box in the center of the cavity, and then we coarse grain the overlap a little bit inside to have something that's relatively smooth. But that's the idea that, of course, r equals zero is just one point, so we have no signal. So we take a small domain within the cavity, and we take it as small as we can. But of course, if you take it too small, you have zero. So you know, 